Hi, my name is Dane Behrens. I'm a civil engineer in, in California, um, working with a group called Environmental Science Associates. Um, and I'm a coastal lagoon restoration um, practitioner. I'll be splitting a talk today with, uh, with uh, Dr. Mara Oriskanen from the Naval Postgraduate School. And we'll be talking a little bit about uh, closure patterns specifically in California and some of their drivers. So uh, I wanted to show this time lapse. This is from a system in Santa Barbara uh, area called uh, Devro Slough, just to kind of show you all um, the similarities between California systems and those elsewhere in other Mediterranean climates. There's a lot of similarities. We have a lot of wave exposure, uh, very intermittent flows. And you know the majority of our systems are actually these intermittent little lagoon systems. Um, and I'm gonna use lagoon as sort of a shorthand throughout, even though I understand that there's different terminologies. Um, and, and really, you know, there's a whole diversity of, of systems in California, and I'm not going to be able to go into too much depth on that, but um, I just wanted to show that um, it's really hard to classify them with one uniform classification because they're each really unique. Um, and uh, Mara will go into detail on one of them a little bit later on the Carmel River. So this map on the left uh, is from the Central Coast Wetland Group showing um, all of the intermittent lagoons in California. And there are pretty large gradients in behavior across that just because stream flow gets a lot weaker as you move south. Also development increases around San Francisco and LA. Um, but really in terms of California characteristics, um, you know, there's a lot of wave exposure and um, especially from the Northwest and Southwest swells, um, we have quite a bit of wave energy, um, especially in winter months. And, um, Tides are pretty moderate, but another characteristic is really that uh, freshwater is, is very flashy. So we, we basically have about four to six months out of the year that are, are bone dry, pretty much. Um, and that, of, of course, affects the behavior of these systems. Basin sizes tend to be small. This is an active continental margin. So we have a lot of steep, uh, small catchments, not very large tidal prisms for the most part. Um, and then when you combine all these things together, what we find is that um, stream flow and, and waves tend to co-vary. They both peak in the same months for the most part, but waves have a flatter distribution. And so what we tend to find is that there's these shoulder seasons in the fall and in the spring when rainfall is not super high that you get a lot of bunched closures together for the most part. And of course, there's a human element here, unsurprisingly. This is a picture from Santa Cruz in the center of the state. Um, you can see the outline from these natural features of where the lagoon floodplain was and how development has encroached on that. This is a very common situation for the developed parts of the state. So to give more of a visual example of what that what these behaviors look like, uh, this is the Russian River, which I studied in grad school. It's north of San Francisco Bay on the left. It's Carmel that Mara will go into more detail on later, uh, south of San Francisco Bay here on the right, showing water level time series and uh, stream flow and waves. This is the shoulder season I was talking about with these red arrows. Just the fact that um, often you have large enough waves to cause closure in, in early fall and in late spring, whereas you often don't have the stream flow to, to really prevent closures or to, um, to shorten them in those months. Whereas in a system like Carmel that's less managed, um, that's smaller, has less stream flow, um, some of those closure events can last much longer, it can be you know six months, 12 months, or even several years if it's dry enough. So you have a, a large diversity of behaviors in California. And as a practitioner working on restoring these systems, you know, really what we try to do is use the best available science. And so I appreciate the work of everyone on this webinar. We often use um, tools from the literature and try to adapt them for these um, projects. What we often um, use are kind of a mix of different types of tools. So on the left is just an example of kind of a empirical relationship of tidal prism versus wave power that goes back several decades. You've seen these from Brune, Johnson, O'Brien and others. These are great, but they're limited in terms of looking at the, the temporal variability. And of course, more recently, there's been 2D and 3D numerical models, which many folks on this webinar will talk about um, and are really great. Um, but we find as you know, managers of these systems, um, these are expensive and, and take a lot of time to develop. And so we have, again, we have a lot of systems and really the challenge that we're facing is just immense. I mean, so the, the, the scale of the habitat loss that we're seeing and the scale of challenges we're facing with sea level rise are so large that it really necessitates that we develop tools that are somewhere in between these two. And so often, you know, as consultants, we try to develop these tools that, you know, are fast and, and accurate enough 
to really be used as a screening tool to look at how different management approaches might affect behavior of a lagoon. When, and then we can pass it on to something like a 2D or 3D model to look in more depth at things like velocities. Um, and of course, modeling, modeling isn't everything and, and, and monitoring is, is gonna be crucial moving forward in terms of long-term adaptation of these systems. So just a quick example of one of the approaches we've tried, this is what we call the quantified conceptual model. Um, we restored this lagoon in San Francisco Bay about 20 years ago. It was historically filled in. Uh, we turned it back into a lagoon. And, and as part of that effort, a colleague of mine, uh, Battaglio, um, uh, developed this sort of time, time varying, time series approach for a closure index to look at how the system might behave. In the last couple of decades, we've continued to advance that um, into more of a water balance tied to a sand balance for the lagoon mouth. Um, you know, working on advancements made from folks here in this list and many others. And this is an example from the Russian River. The black in the background is the observed water levels and the blue is the model. Really, we try to hindcast data um, and see if we can match it as best as we can. And then we look forward and we say, what would happen with a foot of sea level rise? Or if you stopped breaching or if you tried X, Y, or Z type of management. So a lot of what we do is try to do types of screening approaches like that. Um, and really we try to marry that with, with monitoring to the extent that we can, um, working with um, folks like Mara who can really dig into detail into systems um, and look at the physics. And so with that, I'll dig a little bit deeper into the Carmel River system in particular. And just as a reminder, this is close to Monterey Bay. Um, Central California. And this system, just to, to give you a little more physical insight to it, it's about 500 meters north to south, which is the beach. It's bound to the north by rocky headlands as well as to the south by rocky headlands. And so you see this back uh, greenish area, which is the tidal lagoon, but really it's the main river channel, which is indicated there that is responsible for sort of infilling this particular lagoon. And I started studying this site about five years ago with the main research question of, is it possible to predict breaching and closure events at this particular system? Next slide. And so in order to do that, we have to quite kind of first understand how quickly does this breaching happen? And this will hopefully highlight a little bit about the complexity of getting these in situ observations that Dane is talking about. Here on the top, you see uh, evidence of closed versus open states at Carmel River State Beach. This is looking at where you have the complete closure versus complete open, complete open state, but what happens in between? And what we see here is this transition on the bottom set of slides between a completely closed state and a completely open state, which takes on the order of about four hours over the span of less than one quarter tidal cycle, essentially. So it goes from completely just gently trickling over topping very small breach channel to a wide ranging, huge, fully developed breach indicated in the bottom sort of right picture, which is the magenta circle there indicates the, the, the size of a human. So this starts off from literally a trickle to a gigantic data for a gigantic breach in over just the span of a couple hours. So if we're really gonna quantify when does breaching and closure happen with this, we really need to understand what are the flow conditions in the morphological evolution during this breaching. But this is a hard problem. Next slide. And one of the reasons it's so hard to measure is that flow conditions in these breaches, <clears throat> while Dane did a good description of how variable the sort of external environmental forcing are, where we have ranges in discharge in the river from zero to 100 cubic meters per second and variable wave heights between four, two and four meters offshore. One thing that that doesn't do is it doesn't highlight that during an active breach, breach velocities can be in, in exceed four meters per second. This video was taken during one of these active breaching sites. You can see the distortion of the surface of the water, rapid sediment evolution. And so being able to both observe that and to model that is not an easy problem. Next slide. And so what we've done is similar to the quantified conceptual model that Dane was talking about is looking at trying to estimate what would the discharge through this, this breach be as a result of the environmental forcing. And so here on this time series, you see the time series of the, 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 the lagoon where breaches are indicated by green circles and closures are indicated by yellow circles where in contrast to the tides, which are continuously fluctuating, you'll see these episodes where there is no tidal presence inside the lagoon. 
And just to show in contrast to during this state, we see the green line indicates our river discharge is less than about five cubic meters per second for the majority of this time. And then it jumps after a giant precipitation event. And so this flashy going from basically zero to a ton of discharge really indicates that this period is gonna be intermittent. And so this is just for one particular site, but if we look at this over the span of many years, it turns out there is no correlation between when breaches occur and what the tide stage is or what the wave heights are offshore. This means that breaches can occur at both high tide, low tide, rising, falling, and basically any state of waves offshore. But it turns out if we look at the closures and when closures occur, that there's a really strong correlation between closing with the rising and or high tide and combination with large waves. And this was observed through the presence of infragravity energy within the lagoon and sort of infiltration of waves into the lagoon itself. Next slide. And so how we estimate this is, if, again, if I show you the same water level plots, which you saw on the previous slide on the top here, we can look at that relative discharge in the breach itself. Now here I'm comparing the sort of offshore forcing, which is what the Carmel River is producing just through precipitation, compared to the onshore or ocean forcing. And so when these colored blue or red lines are equal to the black line, you have equal and opposite forcing. This would indicate that those discharges are approximately canceling themselves out. And therefore you might be able to have a, a sitting, setting where sediment is able to accumulate in the breach itself. Now, first off, if you have the presence of just tides, you'll notice in, in contrast or in similarity to sort of what those water levels were that this system is a perched system, you will never have sufficient forcing from just the tides alone to close this inlet. Because you see that the water levels in the lagoons maintain elevation above the high tide line, even when the system is open, this is suggesting that for a perch system, the only way that you are going to ever get closing is when you have and include the wave forcing itself. And so this was this was observed over several, several years and supported by this continuous presence that when the inlet is getting close to closing, there was a strong signature of infragravity energy within the lagoon itself. And so next slide. And so this was just at least a little summary of both the complexity of these systems across the state of California, as well as the complexity within one particular system. We haven't even talked about morphological variability for which this challenge, you know, this makes things even more challenging as to how things migrate with sand movement. But really what this comes down to is that we see a substantial data gap in in situ breach observations. It's really challenging to get in the breach at the right time when sand is moving and to actually validate what's going on with that active breaching. Similarly, it's challenging to be there exactly when things are closing and to actually observe this. So we're trying to promote longer term morphological and hydrodynamic data sets at sites and then to also have comparison between sites with differing environmental forcing. How big a system is, how big the tidal prism is, how much discharge they experience is key. And so with that, we'd like to end just by stating that this is really a collaborative effort. So Dane and I work together and it's great to have this cross academic, public and private partnerships that leads to sort of this very rich um, data sharing and, and, and idea sharing that, that happens. And so promoting changes in policy should really leverage that expertise across disciplines. And so again, I'll end with that and say thanks and take any questions.